Disturbing cases of people disappearing into the woods. In 1991, a 12-year-old boy named Jared Negretti went hiking on a camping trip with his Boy Scout troop that consisted of 14 other boys. They were hiking towards the summit of Mount San Gorgonio in the San Bernardino National Forest in Southern California. Jared was on the shorter and heavier side. Around 6 p.m., 1,000 feet away from the summit, another group of hikers spotted Jared straggling behind and notified the scoutmaster at the summit. I just jog him. They said he was seen shortcutting the switchbacks on his way down the trail and was told not to and to stay on the trail by the other hikers. The scoutmaster, who was an experienced hiker, said he would pick up Jared on the way down. When he finally was able to descend the mountain to pick Let's up guess. Jared, He's not there. he was nowhere to be seen. As soon as the scoutmaster realized that Jared had disappeared, he took the other scouts and his troop back to base camp and then hiked about five miles in the dark to get help. Sheriff's deputies, along with search and rescue teams, began searching a 130 square mile area of the San Gorgonio wilderness, well, you're not very find rocky, him. tree-lined terrain. Within three days, their search was focused on a six square mile area where a footprint believed to match one of Jared's high top tennis shoes was found. Searchers also discovered beef jerky and candy wrappers believed to have been dropped by Jared, and perhaps most importantly, his camera was found. Okay. On the film roll were 12 pictures. Most were landscapes taken by the boy when he was still with the troop, but the last one shows a self-portrait in which it seems he pointed the camera at his face, aided with the flash of the camera. <laughs> Oh my god, why the fuck did you play that, bro? <sighs> bro, that's, that sound, I thought someone was gonna like, like, oh my god, man. Bro, normally you don't include like anything jumpy. Bro. Yeah, literally, I just got scared of nothing, bro. I just got scared. But then again, there is someone in the background. There's something here. This is, so technically, I got scared of something. I got scared of something. It seems he pointed the camera at his face, aided with the flash of the camera. It's possible he lost the camera when he slid down a portion of the mountainside. At least 70 officers, including some airlifted by helicopter and some on horseback, were deployed. Some of the helicopters were even equipped with infrared scanning. Over the next two weeks, as many as 3,000 people had logged 45,000 hours. Yo, are we not gonna talk about... Are we not gonna... This is... Bro, this is a face, bro. Are we not gonna talk about this? Are we not gonna... Are we not gonna talk about this? That's his ear. How long do you think his ear is? Are you guys okay? You think he's Dumbo? You think he's Dumbo? Chat, normally you guys are spot on with things, right? But that's ridiculous. You think his ear comes all the way out here? Well, then he's got the biggest ear on the planet. possible he lost the camera when he slid down a portion of the mountainside. At least 70 officers, including some airlifted by helicopter and some on horseback, were I deployed. I see a face. Some of the helicopters were even equipped with infrared scanning. Over the next two weeks, as many as 3,000 people had logged 45,000 hours searching 50 square miles of the San Bernardino National Forest. So the question is, did he fall off the trail and slip down the mountainside? While it's possible, it seems unlikely that his body wouldn't have been found in the immediate area around the switchbacks he was cutting down. Some people think he may have been the victim of a bear attack, but this Maybe. seems unlikely as well. Why? There were no signs of blood, drag marks, or other evidence linked to any animal attack. Some believe he was abducted by a predator, given the mountain is well used by hikers. To this- Yo, I, I love how- Oh wait, yeah. Humans are predators, innit? To this day, three decades later, Jared's remains have never been- Oh, would you look at that chat? You can actually see his ear here. And guess what? He's not Dumbo. So that definitely was not his ear. Look, you can see it here. In fact, he's got quite small ears. Found. On the cold night of February 24th, they've been found by hikers. 
To this day, three decades later, Jared's remains have never been found. Wait, what? On the cold night of February- Wait, chat, what do you think happened to him then? How, how did he just disappear? How did he just disappear? February 24th, 1978, five young men from Yuba County, California, I'm Bill Sterling, Jack Hutes, Ted Weir, Jack Madruga, and Gary Mathias headed to California State University to Weir. I ain't gonna lie. I ain't going anywhere with this person. You tell me I'm going on a trip and they're, they're involved, I ain't going. I ain't going. Why? I'm getting like some very, very, very crazy vibes. I'm getting some very, very, I, I ain't going with him. I ain't going with him. Jack Madruga and Gary Mathias headed to California State University to attend a basketball game. When the group of men didn't return the next day, friends and family grew concerned. What should have been a quick road trip to see a basketball game turned into a mystery that has never been solved. All five men suffered their own mild forms of mental issues, but they were still able to fully function in society. Okay. The men were scheduled to play in a Special Olympics basketball game of their own the next day, for which they prepared their clothes before leaving for California State University the day prior. A police search ensued shortly after they were reported missing, and a few days later, the men's car was found abandoned far from the route they should have taken to return to Yuba City. In fact, it was a whole hour in the wrong direction of Yuba City, having been driven up a winding mountain pass in the Plumas National Forest at the northern point of the Sierra Nevada. But it was the guy the that had, had to a point few out. empty food wrappers and drink bottles. Apart from that, the car was empty. The car was found in working condition. It was lodged in a snowbank with no signs of foul play. Hey, Detective Lewis on the case. Okay, so with your guys' help, we came to the conclusion they all look a little bit crazy. They all abducted each other. You know, have you seen the Spider-Man meme where they're all pointing at each other? They all did that. They all just took each other. I don't know where they all took each other. They probably just agreed to go to an island somewhere and just agreed that they're all going to kidnap each other. I don't know. However, the car could have been easily pushed out by the five circle. young men, raising more questions. For the next week or so, police and forest rangers searched the area hoping for any signs of them. But unfortunately, any possible tracks of the men or even, God forbid, their bodies, were covered by a passing snowstorm. Multiple sightings of the five young men were reported, but none led to their discovery. First, a man named Joseph Scones called police, saying he saw the group of men on the Friday they disappeared while he was trying to push his stuck car out of the snow. You would find Joseph five suffered men. a mild heart attack while trying to push his car out, and when he saw flashlight beams outside his car and a small group of men, he tried to call and ask the men for help but they suddenly disappeared as if they ignored him. A second witness said she saw five men in a red pickup truck on Saturday and Sunday. And All right, chat, this actually don't make sense. Like, let's be serious for a second, yeah? Because five men, a bear ain't gonna take on five men. Yeah, it might take one, but then it's gonna run away, bro. It ain't gonna take on five men. A kidnapper ain't gonna take on five men. Like, how do five men disappear? See, aliens could take five men. Ants could take five men. Five bears. <laughs> five bears. An hour from where the car was abandoned, she told police that two of the men came into her store to buy food and use the phone while the rest stayed in the truck. Okay. Their disappearances continued to baffle everybody, even more so when the snow melted months later, in June of that same year because more questions arose. A local man noticed a broken window on a Forest Service trailer, and when police inspected it, they found the dead body of Ted Weir inside. He appeared to have died from starvation, despite having food readily available nearby in the trailer. What? He was wrapped in many layers of blankets, and his feet were badly frostbitten. But what makes no sense is the fireplace, which could have been easily set up and could have kept him warm, was completely untouched. And on top of that, warm snow clothes that were found in the trailer were unused by Ted. It's well, well, to me, that just means somebody's put him there after he's died. Possible he lived up to 13 weeks after the initial disappearance. 20 miles away from where the what? car had been abandoned, the bones of Bill Sterling, Jack Hutes, and Jack Madruga were found not far from Ted's emaciated body, spread out from each other. They had died of hypothermia. Strangely, Gary was never found. What well, then? It's him! It's him then! 
He killed them all. Hey, who said the guy with the glasses was a creepy one? You was correct. Always trust your gut. He, he killed them all then. He killed them all. Obviously. From each other. They had died of hypothermia. Strangely, Gary was never found. Only his shoes were discovered in the nearby woods. To this day, no one can figure out why the group had gone in the direction they did, or why they left their perfectly functioning car, which the five men could have easily pushed out from the snow, How would he to kill separate from people, each other, dog? and eventually starve or freeze to death. On top of this, all of their families agreed that it was uncharacteristic of them to not help John Scones push his car out from the snow when he called out for help, and why Ted didn't even attempt to start a fire or the trailer's heating system, or eat the food found in the trailer, still makes no sense at all. He was dead all. before. He was dead before. Craig Freer of Scotia, New York was 17 when he was last seen in June of 2004. He was a popular kid with dimples, red hair, and a welcoming smile as he was described by friends and family. He was a star soccer player at the Scotia Glenville High School and about to be named captain of his team. Craig also picked up a part-time job and his future was looking bright. There were a few colleges interested in offering Craig a scholarship for his athletic abilities. Okay. And one could say the world was truly his oyster but that all changed on June 27th, 2004. On that day, he walked into the woods and was never seen again. So rewinding a bit, when Craig picked up his job at the Price Chopper Supermarket in Glenville, New York, his parents were proud that he'd be fitting working in with his busy schedule. On the dreaded day of Craig's disappearance, he was seen by his parents walking out of his home for what would be the last time. His parents were under the impression he was going to work. His mother Veronica had even seen him carrying his uniform with him to his car, but when she went to go shopping at the supermarket later where Craig worked, just a few hours after he left home for a shift, she was confused when there was no trace of him. Veronica learned that Craig had actually lost his job at the supermarket after two months of employment and had been hiding it from his parents. He had been pretending to work there for weeks after his termination so that his parents wouldn't know he was no longer employed. Another bad it's sign. unknown why he was fired though, likely for not showing up. Very upset with their son, Craig's parents called his girlfriend since he left his phone behind. They did not yet know that she was his ex-girlfriend. They called her to see if they knew where he was, and at first she said she had no idea, but after a second call, out of guilt, she admitted that he was with her. Veronica lectured Craig over the phone, telling him that he needed to come home right away and that they needed to talk to him. Little did they know he was visiting her because he was upset about their recent breakup. Craig said goodbye to his ex-girlfriend and left her apartment located in Scotia as well. And according to his ex-girlfriend, she watched as he walked towards his car, but then stood still for a moment, then darted off in the opposite direction as if something had scared him and he was running away from imminent danger. However, if that were the case, it would have made more sense to drive away before this, he told his mother he would be home in 10 minutes over the phone, the time it would take to drive from his ex-girlfriend's to home. Around the time that call ended, Craig's dad arrived at the complex and saw his son's car was still parked outside. By 5 p.m. that day, Veronica had reported her son missing, and at first police weren't too interested, assuming it was just a normal kid running away for the day because of an argument with parents. But as hours turned into days, and when the investigators found out that he didn't have his phone or wallet with him at the time of his disappearance, they agreed something was wrong and began to further investigate. Yeah, I, bro, it sounded like he did, done the thing that you should never do and commit a dude. That's what it sounds like. But then again, you would find the body, no? Like, you'd find it. Police hit a big lead when a few teenagers came forward to tell police that they had seen Craig or someone matching his description walking along the railroad tracks behind his ex-girlfriend's apartment complex oh. shortly after he was seen entering the woods. They claimed that when they tried to call to him, he motioned for them to be quiet with his finger to his lips and then just kept on walking, disappearing into the woods. Investigators started searching up and down the railway line with no luck. Police dogs were used while searching the woods even checking the nearby Mohawk River, but all these searches turned up nothing, as if Craig had just vanished into thin air. Of course, after two decades, police investigations have largely scaled back, but in 2021, a new lead was discovered. One of Craig's co-workers at the Price Chopper supermarket told investigators that sometime between June 27th and June 2nd, 2004, he saw Craig in the passenger seat of a car traveling north on Route 50 in Glenville, According to the witness, the car stopped at the traffic lights on Sheffield Road before turning left and disappearing up the intersecting road. 
Craig's family is still hoping that one day they'll learn the truth what? about what happened to their son. For a well-liked 17-year-old with such a bright future, no one can seem to understand how or why he'd just vanish into the woods. Wait, you, wait, you just, you reckon he just ran away? And lastly, here's one many of you may have heard before, but still remains one of the creepiest National Park disappearances I've ever heard. Hey, Tom, goodbye so much for the prime. In March of 2014, two Dutch young women, Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon, went to- Yeah, I can't even remember the date, what, like, a month ago, if you told me, like, what happened. I'd have no clue, mate. 20 years? Panama for a vacation. Two Dutch young women, Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon, went to Panama for a vacation to reward themselves for graduating. To make it a little more upsetting, the two had taken on extra shifts the month prior in order to pay for it. Reaching Panama, they soon headed for the town of Bouquet, where they were hosted by a family. Shortly after, on April 1st, 2014, Chris and Lisanne vanished as they were hiking the trails in the forest around the town of Bouquet which in of itself was strange because they were scheduled for a tour guide by the name of Feliciano to assist them on the trails for the following day. He did it! The two women made their way for the trails, accompanied by the host family's dog named Blue. When Blue arrived back home later that evening without the girls, the family became concerned and tried contacting the mother of Lisanne, who then proceeded to try to make contact with her daughter, but to no avail. On April 2nd, the following day, Feliciano was waiting for the girls to show up for their hike but they never arrived. He went to the home of the host family the girls were staying at, but they weren't there as well. In fact, most of the women's belongings were still there prior to their disappearances. The women did have their cell phones, but they wouldn't answer any attempted calls. As panic began to set in with everyone, the police were contacted and an extensive search began, with the help of everyone from farmers and locals, to detectives, search dogs, helicopters, and more. The search lasted for 10 days, yet no trace of Chris and Lisanne were found. Two months had passed and a local found a backpack belonging to one of the women. Okay. To everyone's shock and horror, skeletal remains were also discovered, and after DNA testing, oh. they were shown to be matches for both women. The story doesn't end there, though. While continuing the investigation, their cell phone logs were released. The two women were trying to make 911 phone calls throughout the stretch of the 10 days, but they couldn't get service. Although believed to be a possible accident of getting lost and injured in the forest, which therefore resulted in succumbing to the elements, strange discoveries were made that brought that theory into question. Inside one of the backpacks, there was a camera with 100 photos stored on the memory, taken within those 10 days of their vanishing. Most of these photos were normal, scenic pictures documenting what was supposed to be the two young women's fun vacation. Okay. The police were also able to take the pictures that the women took and match them up with their phone calls to 911. Disturbingly, cell phone data shows that only two hours after this seemingly happy photo was taken, they attempted to call 911. It starts to become stranger though. 10 out of the 100 pictures were taken within the 10 days. The other 90 were taken afterwards around 1 to 4 in the morning in complete darkness. It may be that they were taken to get some form of vision at night through the flesh, but it's not been confirmed. Some believe that it wasn't even the girls that took these pictures. In one photo of a close-up of the back of Chris's head, it seems to show a wound to the right side in the temple area and blood on her hair. Lisanne may have been using the camera light to see how bad Chris's injury was. Some oh, people believe shit. Chris was actually deceased in this photo and that their murderer was the one taking the photo. Disturbingly, there was a hiking shoe that still had a foot in it that belonged to Chris. Also found was a pelvic bone that belonged to Lee San. As of right now, the accepted theory by police is that the two women went off the beaten path of the trail and one of them was injured. Then the other woman was trying to provide help and became injured herself in the process, which then led to starvation and dehydration. I see chat. I would think it is them just going off and getting injured, right? But two hours after taking a happy photo. You know what I'm saying? Two hours. You took a happy photo and then two hours. I suppose you could get injured in two hours and then you call 911. Because you're injured. I don't know. Weird.
Very strange. But this is just a theory, and whether this is true, or if the two girls were targeted by someone out in the woods, will potentially forever remain unknown. Hey, don't zoom in like that. But wait, what if the tour guide had something to do with it? That's what I said! A lot of people believe Feliciano had something to do with their deaths. In fact, multiple women have left reviews on the tour guide, warning women not to go into the woods alone with him, as he can become very touchy-flirty, even allegedly joking with one girl that he chop her leg off. On top of this, Felice- Chat, this is why I'm the best detective on the planet. What did I say right at the start? What did I say straight away? I just knew, bro. I just knew. I just- I got some powers within me. When I seen him, I went, he did it. I just knew, bro. Even allegedly joking with one girl that he chopped her leg off. Yep, no, On top it's him. Of this, Feliciano was the one to find the shoe with a foot in it behind a specific tree trunk, almost as if he knew to look there. Okay. There are a lot more details that go into this theory. It was but him. That would remain a video for a different day. For now, whether the tour guide had any part in their disappearance it was may him. forever remain a mystery, just like the rest of this case. Well, it's not a mystery. Police need to arrest him, bro. It was him. I can tell you now, 100%. 100%. Because, and the reason why we know is because when I seen his face, I knew it was him. And now with the bad reviews and like all the other stuff, 100% was him.